I've got this fancy dancy computer screen up here to look at. And uh, Uh oh. Yeah, I've hit it a few times here. Nothing's doing. Yeah, if you could. I'm a little lost here, I guess. Nice. Select the tab. Okay. Bear with me. Ah. All right. Sweet. All right. I've been doing a very poor job of uh, articulating the uh, vision statement that I have for the church this year, and that is to really focus on the covenant. And as I was thinking about this week, we're in the month of May already, and we haven't talked about it very much. This morning, all I want to do is just read the first paragraph of our covenant. For those of you who aren't familiar with the covenant, it's just a promise. When we became members of this church, we decided to do a certain amount of things for each other and for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the church and for the sake of unity. These are the things that we've committed to. So, for example, protecting the unity of our church by acting in love toward other members, by refusing to gossip, and by following the leaders. So, again, if a, a bubble of conviction comes up in your heart that maybe there's something there that you could do better, whatever that may be, I would very much encourage you to think about that, and I think that you would uh, uh, be really blessed by your God that when you've, when, you've, when you've given your word, for example, you've fulfilled your word, okay? When you've promised to do something, that you've fulfilled your promise to do something, okay? And I think uh, in the days that we do make a promise, and hopefully we don't make very many of them. But in regards to this church, I think it's a very good thing that we commit ourselves as much as we can to being a person of integrity and doing all each other that we would do for each other. Okay. Well, that being said, we are going to talk about Jonah again. I was debating on whether or not I would stay in this section of Scripture or move on. But uh, I have a lot to say in Jonah, and the more times I move on, the, <laughs> the longer it's going to take us to get through Jonah. So uh, I've kind of worked in my thoughts that I wanted to give a mother today uh, into the book of Jonah. So as far as sermon topics are still concerned, we're still going to be talking about the condition of Jonah's life, and we're still going to be talking about the progression of sin, but there is this kind of Mother's Day perspective that I want to challenge mothers with. Just organized thoughts, and uh, I realize that this sermon needs to be taken in by the fact that your pastor, who has children, uh, is doing the best job that he can possibly do. Um, unlike many other jobs uh, in the church or, or even in the workplace, it really does matter how I lead my family. And if you see me leading my family poorly, I should probably, or I should, the scripture would say, escape the office of pastor. There's a real commitment here that I have to obey scripture and do it right. Uh, I can say confidently, that I've examined scripture and how I parent. I've had lots of experiences working at a group home in which I was a professional parent uh, for kids that were not my own. And I did that for four years and, and uh, got to serve uh, well over 40 children. And so out of, out of my experiences and out of my study of scripture comes this, this message that uh, is given to us that I believe is in Jonah. I think that... Uh, Although we're taking a little bit of liberty here with Scripture, I don't think it's outside of the bounds. I don't think it's, I don't think it's uh, taken too far. I think we're going to honor Scripture really well uh, as we talk about this topic. Now, my sermon title is an interesting one. I said, a mother of a sinner, now what? Right? And I realized that when I wrote that, that maybe people are going to be kind of where this uh, sermon is going to be heading. I think as men, right, when we think of the word mother, we don't necessarily think of something positive. It's usually it's probably something like negative, like the way that we say it, like mother. You know, so, you know, when we think about this section of scripture and about Jonah, I think as men, 
we could probably admit that Jonah was a mother of a sinner. Okay? And uh, I think you'd be right. Well, the reason why I say that is because he was given so much. He was given a relationship with the Lord. He was given God's word. He was given an opportunity to serve the Lord. And he shucked it all. He, he, he peeled away what God wanted him to do and, and threw it away to do something else. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty, pretty big sin, okay? There's a lot of people on this earth that they, uh, as Paul would say, they sin out of ignorance. They just, they just don't know the word of God. Uh, I think God will judge in the end days accordingly. People who have heard the word, I think will be judged a little bit stronger than people who haven't heard the word. And so this morning here, we're talking about a mother of a sinner. Like he's, he's probably one of the better examples of someone who clearly had faith, clearly struggled in their faith. Ladies, perhaps you read this sermon title differently, and that you are in a righteous battle with one of your kids who has taken themselves down a path of sin. And the question becomes, now what? Now, now what do I do? My kid is on a path leading to destruction. I know that they're there. I, I don't know exactly what to do in this situation. And, and I don't think age is relevant here, okay? Um, from the smallest kid to your oldest kid, uh, you can have this, this, this dilemma with your children in the sense that you see the path that they're on and you're just shaking your head and saying, I'm a 90-year-old man. I'm a... 70-year-old mom, like, what can I possibly do for my children in order to help them come off of this road of destruction that they're on? Ladies, also, I just want to play into your feelings here just for a moment, if I can, in the sense that I want you to remember some things, okay? Do you remember the uh, joy or the emotions associated with getting the news that you were pregnant? Do you remember, though, that emotion? Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it was a little less positive, maybe, because you weren't expecting that baby to be born or something. Or do you remember carrying that child for nine months? Do you remember how that felt? Do you remember the, the long days, the long nights, the nauseousness maybe that you felt carrying a child? Do you remember the pain of bringing that child into the world and what that felt like? Do you remember them holding holding them in your arms for the very first time as you looked into their little face thinking, you are my little angel. Do you remember how, how much we thought that they were like perfect in every possible way? They got a cute little button nose and they're perfect. They're like a little angel. All right. And as a mother, you bonded with that child because they needed you personally for survival. Like there was no getting around it. I mean, there's just some things that a mother can do that is just a miracle from God, right? Then came the day, perhaps beginning at age around two or three, when the thought of your angel was a distant memory, and now the thought is more like, they are not an angel from heaven, but a demon child from hell. Too harsh? That may be a little too harsh. I don't know. But I'm sure that we've all felt that. I mean, I've felt that, you know. Uh, even as a Christian man, where did this spawn of Satan come from? You know, how, how, do I, how do I deal with this child? But I think everyone has experienced a relationship breakdown. And I think we see those relationships uh, break down uh, sometimes repeatedly in our lives uh, between us and our kids or between our kids and our mom. And a lot of that has to do with sin, obviously. And I think we've all experienced the hard work associated with trying to teach discipline and yet still show an amazing love to said child. And the reality for all of us is no one has done this perfect 100% of the time, right? If anybody is a perfect parent, stand up and let us applaud you, okay? Uh, the reality is, is parenting is an experience. Parenting is something that you do uh, uh, for 18 years in a home, and then parenting is something that you do for the rest of your life. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't go away. You're still their mom, right? And the responsibility is still there. And then you get the joy of being grandma or great-grandma or great-great-grandma, right? I mean, who gets the joy of that? I mean, I only wish we could have the joy of that. So my intent for this sermon, where are we heading? Here's my intent. 
Number one, I want to normalize what is happening when sin enters and relationships break down between you and your most cherished loved ones. Okay? And secondly, I want to encourage you to be 100% different from the sin or the sinner that you face today. Whatever sin is, is going on in, in that relationship, I'm, I'm going to strongly encourage you this morning to be 100% different than the sinner or the sinner that you face. Okay? And we'll talk about that. Beginning with number one, the first point of normalizing your situation to all others in this room can first by be first realized by just reading the scriptures. So let's get into that. Jonah chapter 1, and let's just read verses 1 through 5, where it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen asleep. Now, in this section of Scripture, the question very simply becomes, what do you see? I mean, this is... This is a historical event. There's a lot of description there. The question when you look at a section of Scripture, regardless of whether it's four verses or five verses, is what is obvious? What, what, is, what can be plainly seen from our text? And here we saw our Heavenly Father instruct His child in what to do, and we saw that child totally disobey and run away from that direction. All right? That's, that's as plain as day. In other words, although our experiences seem only to be specific to us, maybe in this moment, in our generation, and all the rest of it, God's Word shows us that children abandon the directions of their parent or parents to crazy extremes. Extremes like foolishly running away or foolishly avoiding contact with that parent. And these things are not new. Okay? It is a problem that has plagued humanity for as old as Jonah and before. You know, if you've ever experienced any kind of drama like this, this is not a new problem. This is a problem you can go right into Scripture and say, it happened to him. It happened to God. And likewise, maybe if we're super honest, I was that person who was running for a period of time. The second normalizing factor is that we are all sinners. Amen? I mean, you know the scripture, Romans 3.23, which says what? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Has anybody heard the direction of the Lord and gone the other direction? I, yeah, right? Has anybody shucked the uh, direction that was given a parent by a parent? Yeah, absolutely we have. You know, I mean, dad said, be home at 10. Whatever that means. I thought you meant 10 a.m., Dad, right? Like, of course we have. So we can just approach this whole situation with some honesty. We know that the things our kids are doing are very similar to the things that we have done. Similar. Maybe not specifically, but very similar, if you were just to look at it from a global perspective. And you may, for example, be the mother of a sinner. But our mother is also a mother of a sinner, and sin is sin, right? Like, every mother is a sinner, and every mother who ever births a child is a mother of a sinner, okay? Like, you can't, <laughs> for we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, although some kids pull a Jonah and run, I just want to encourage you that other children uh, run by being passive. Some children, rather than escaping outward, escape inward, All right? And even as adults, we, we, we tend to do that. We run inside of ourselves. And I think, from my experience, uh, it's maybe easiest described as the difference between raising boys and girls. Now, I've had the pleasure of raising 
helping to raise over 40 children. And I think that in my time with managing children and managing households and raising different personalities and different children, my, boy, my wife and I would both agree that there is a stark difference between how a boy acts and how a girl acts when they're defying obedience. Uh, boys often act out in a very aggressive way. And honestly, I like raising boys a whole lot better than raising girls. I really do, okay? Uh, there is no mistaking when a boy is upset. They will throw a tantrum and destroy the home. When I was at the group home, I remember my first big tantrum. It was 30 minutes long by a little boy named Christian, ironically. And he was peeling the paint off the wall in his tantrum, right? And another violent child that I was helping to raise, uh, he would just d go through the house like a tornado and just destroy everything in his sight. Finally, I just handed him a wiffle ball bat and I said, take this bat outside and go beat that tree down. The tree will take it, but I can't take you beating on things inside the house. You want to beat on something, pick on someone your own size. And he went out there with that wiffle ball bat and he was hacking on that tree for half an hour. Obviously, the tree wasn't falling down and the bat got destroyed, but yeah. Better. Um, Ephesians 6, 4 um, reminds us as dads or fathers that we shouldn't provoke our children to anger. But the reality of it is, is men can be angry. And in their angriness, they can provoke others to anger. I mean, that's just the reality of being a guy. Uh, the challenge to us as fathers is to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So we have to harness in that anger and do it appropriately. Now, girls. Girls are different than that in a lot of ways, right? With being aggressive for the most part. Um, I've learned in my experience that girls often act out by controlling or manipulating by harnessing the power of the mind within, I guess you would say. Uh, I think this often happens and I think that when you're trying to discipline a lady and, and grow her up it drives you to insanity like she's playing mind games with me and I'm trying to unravel everything that she is doing inside my brain at that moment and figure out what she really means because she's not communicating to me in a way that I fully understand I remember at the group home we had girls uh, that were very agreeable during the day oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah sure yep yep whatever, whatever you want and then at night they would just sneak out they're just gone, right? Uh, so they had a problem with their honesty, if you will, or their integrity. Um, our girls uh, that we had the group home would retreat to silence or they would retreat to music rather than to relationship building. And they would just kind of go within themselves rather than going out of themselves, looking for clarity or looking for understanding, even in a negative, aggressive way. Uh, they're, they're, we've noticed that the girls are, are internalizing a lot more. Um, and sometimes we would wake up if we had a, had a girl who was just spiraling out of control and something in the house would get broken and no one would know who it is, right? Well, we, we, know, we, know, who it, we know who it is, right? Like we had a, had a bad day uh, with that lady that day. I, I think uh, Proverbs 21, 19 gives women some encouragement. If anger is kind of disruptive in a guy's life and a woman's life, and Proverbs 21, 19 says, it is better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and irritating woman. And sometimes, uh, ladies, uh, I think we all can be humble enough to understand that in our endeavor to get through life, we can become naggers or irritators or something in order to kind of produce the result that we want. So having hopefully normalized what we experienced with not only what God experiences with us and what we experience with our children, I'm hoping that we can turn to our second point. And again, I'm trying to normalize this and saying that we all, we all struggle with sin and we all struggle in relationships. And mom, uh, the battles that you face at home sometimes are daily, and hourly. And you're, to Jeremy's point, guys, we're blessed in the sense that we can escape for 12 hours at a time. You know, uh, the mothers are there uh, picking up the slack. I mean, really helping to uh, teach and grow our children in a really healthy way.
So the second point is to encourage you to be 100% different from the sinner, sinner you face even today. So let me offer you another slide, and I'm going to kind of use Jonah as an example here. We talked about in past weeks about the downward spiral of sin, and the number one thing that we talked about was how Jonah uh, was daft. In other words, that he was acting out in a very silly or foolish way during his temptation. Now, he was silly because he negated the word of the Lord. He was silly because he took his theology and, and made it in the back seat of his life because he was trying to leave the presence of the Lord, which we know it can't be done. And so, too, uh, when we're caught up in sin in those very first steps, uh, we oftentimes behave uh, like a fool, okay? And uh, the that is absolutely true. The encouragement for moms today is to be 100% different from even this beginning stage of sin. In other words, don't be foolish in how you handle a fool. Okay? Don't battle their sin on a foundation or an arena of their choosing. You need to transport them and the situation into a field of battle that they absolutely cannot win. And I say that because it, it says what I want it to say, but we know that raising our kids is not a game, all right? It's not about, quote, unquote, winning or losing, but it's about winning them for the Lord. It's about winning in the areas of love. It's about winning in the areas of instruction and having our kids be successful in a healthy, non-monetary way, okay? And so we need to win the battle uh, for our kids. And uh, I, I truly believe that we just can't battle on every hill that the kids want to battle on. I, I, I don't think that that's a, a good thing for your life. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, let me use James 1.20 as an example. If you want to hold a finger here and go to James. James 1.20, I've met, mentioned this before, and I think it's a, one of the more important uh, Proverbs here, even in James, and uh, it's something that is a good verse to memorize. In James 1.20, it says, For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And it's so true. If your child is an angry girl or an angry boy, and for us who are older, uh, my daughter's turning 18 this year, um, If your child is a woman or if your child is a man and they want to hurl angry and hurtful words at you, I'm, I'm just encouraging you to not battle on that field of play with them. All right? Don't, don't battle using those weapons. In fact, I would encourage you to not even engage on that battlefield. If they're just throwing harsh words and insults, as Matthew 5 would say, what? Turn the other cheek. You say, but that's my kid. I can't turn the other cheek to my kid. You think screaming at them and pounding them in on the floor and making them look terrible is better? I don't think you're going to get the results you're looking for. Okay? From American history, uh, we saw how George Washington moved his troops to what is now New York City um, during the British invasion in order to fortify it and protect colonial interests. What we found out through history is that the British arrived with so much force that George masterfully had to retreat with his 9,000 soldiers to fight another day. And because he retreated in that moment, eventually he won the war, didn't he? And there's a, sometimes a real important aspect of just kind of retreating in that moment because you know that the battle is so much bigger than why is your underwear on the floor, okay? Better than any retreat of a military force in history is the story of the cross. So here you have Jesus who is facing an angry, mocking, swearing, sinful mob, and yet he did not let his own righteous anger consume those people, although he could have. And he was quoted as such. He could rain down a legion of angels to protect him if he so chose. Rather, he picked the field of play. If you think about it, Christ was 
created everything that we have in our world today, including time. Christ chose the field of play. He chose the hardest consequence in all of human history in the Roman world on a cross. That was where Christ decided to die for our sins. He chose the field of play. And in that field of play, he chose it to display his love. Jesus won the war, even though the people thought that they had won the battle that day by showing the Jewish world that he was not God and could be killed. They thought they had won. Did they win? No. All right? And our perspective as mothers and fathers is so much bigger than the perspective of our children. And you have to think bigger. And you have to think through this situation in order to not just fight every battle that comes your way. So we look back at the battleground of the cross and we see the masterful plan of our Lord and Savior to display true wickedness and true rebellion and yet true love and true victory. And so again, mom, uh, you don't need a battle every time someone draws a line in the sand. You don't, you don't need a battle that battle. In fact, you know how the... Jewish people tried to kill Jesus multiple times. In fact, they pushed him to the edge of the cliff. And what did he do? They drew a line, he walked through the crowd, and he disappeared from their sides. It wasn't the day to pick that battle. It wasn't that day to battle those people, not in that moment. But when we do battle, my encouragement to you is battle in ways that display the love of God and the love that you have for your child. From last week, we talked about this other point, and that is distance. We talked about how sin creates distance, and we see this uh, in this section of Scripture in the sense that here is Jonah, and he is in verse 3 trying to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so he went down 60 miles to Joppa, and he found a ship which was going to Tarshish, which is from the furthest point on the Mediterranean to the Atlantic Ocean on the on the side of Spain. That's how far he was trying to go uh, away from the presence of the Lord. And Jonah was trying to create distance. Instead of drawing near to God for help in accomplishing what we know God would want from us or what Jonah knew what God wanted from him, from what we knew was right, Jonah distanced himself from him and quite possibly others. And my argument to you, again, is to be 100% distant from the sinner, sinner you face today. And so when we look at Jonah's story, we see a man who created distance in his sin. So the ultimate question I have for you this morning is, did God battle Jonah using the same war tactic? Did he fight distance with distance? Did God also retreat from Jonah's life? No, absolutely he didn't. You know why? Because that was his son. He was going to chase him down. And that's how we know we are children of God. I mean, this is the only hell that you'll experience. You realize that, right? If this hell brings discipline in your life, praise God for that. I guarantee you, you want that kind of hell versus the hell that's to come. Amen? So verse 1-4 kind of talks about it. You see this word in my, my uh, translation that says, however, however, the Lord hurled a great wind. And so God, in his love, pursued Jonah with a storm. And in verse 17 of the same chapter, we see that God also pursued Jonah with a fish that kept him alive even while he was still in his sin and not yet repentant. That's the love of a father. I know my, sin, I know my son is on the wrong road. I know that he's going to make a terrible choice, and I'm going to have to be there to catch him. And if I have to catch him with a great big ship or a great big uh, fish, I'll do it. I mean, whatever it takes. And even though if he isn't repenting yet of his sin, I'm still going to show him how much I care for him. I'm still going to be there to catch him and love on him. And obviously we see a balance here. We see a child running to sin and away from his father. We see a father acting 100% different and not allowing his child to escape his presence. The storm was necessary and the fish was necessary. And when we look at this section of scripture and all the times we remember Jonah, we don't, we don't think of God being harsh here. We think, how great is the love of God here? And good discipline is like that. 
You know, we, we can look at what happened between our life and our children's lives, and we can admire what parents do righteously in their children's lives because they can see the great love being poured out to take care of that child. In other words, there is a way of pursuing a child that is appropriate and loving, and there's a way of avoiding a child, which is what they really want in their sin, that causes permanent damage emotionally because no one is drawing near. So I'll give you a pastoral perspective, and it's just my perspective. If you don't want to embrace my perspective, and if you feel like you've got it handled and you've got it figured out, praise God for that. That's between you, your God, your wife, and your child. But one of my biggest concerns for parents is using time out and discipline or avoiding their child because they do not know how else to handle them. I personally believe that doing that wrong creates an emotionally damaging space in which a child will self-justify their actions. They will also imitate their parents in creating distance between them and their parents. And even more destructive, I believe that they begin to go down a path of self-comforting to stabilize their out-of-control emotions. Okay? I mean, I... I Again, it's my perspective. I, I really believe it in the depths of my heart as truth. Otherwise, I wouldn't even bring it up this morning. But when kids are alone, it's never usually great. You know, it's like, when do you ever walk into your home and everybody's like engulfed into a Bible study? I mean, normally it's, normally it's not that way. Normally it's, it's something different. When kids are alone and the cat is away, the mouse can play. And in those moments... Even as adults who are children, we please ourselves. Given the opportunity to be away from accountability, how do we act? Sometimes pretty unrighteously because our integrity is not in check. And we can't expect our children to be full of integrity as well. I think that when children are left alone, it can be a gateway for self-deception in the mind. They can grow up to have twisted identity issues. They can have daddy issues. They can, have, they can fall into drugs, inappropriate sexual activity, bitterness, rage, and so on. And when kids are left alone to think, they are far much more likely to listen to Satan whisper in their ear that they are unloved or that they are worthless. I think a much better solution is to isolate the kid with you. With you. You got to isolate the kid? Fine. Take him with you. Okay. You discipline as hard as you need, and you display love at the same time. If you've got to bring a, the worst storm ever to the sea of this kid's life, fine. But that kid needs you to be there in that moment. I'll give you one example I think we all can understand. If you ever spank your child, which I think there's no time for that, you cannot spank your child and then just walk away immediately. You just can't do it. You just... And I think you all realize that. You just can't, you can't do that. You must stay with that child until that child emotionally stabilizes. You have to. You know people who beat you and walk away. They're not great people, okay? If they are screaming at you because you hit them and demand you to leave their presence, you probably have used the wrong discipline method or they are way too old. Uh, I want to just say discipline is for growth, for improvement. It is for a display of love. Now, I have a testimony here from the group home. We had a few children who were, well, I shouldn't say a few, most of our children were very disobedient and wanted to uh, run away. I wouldn't say, I, okay, I say why I wrote that. We, obviously, we had a lot of disobedient children. A few wanted to run away. In one instance, we asked a very simple and loving question. Where are you going to sleep tonight? A bridge? Are you going to sleep in a cardboard box tonight? Will you be warm enough? And then here comes the love. Let me, let me, in this act, last act of love, help me pack your bags. Let me, as the person who loves you most, make sure that you have a sweater because it's going to be super cold out there. How will you eat? Let me, as an act of love, supply you with as much food as I can possibly give you for this trip. 
Let me at least pack a sandwich for your trip. Let me display great love while you're making this terrible choice. In the one case that we had at the group home, we did this, and the child made it to the end of the sidewalk, stopped there for a minute, took a big sigh, looked around, turned around and walked back into the house. And here's my arms. So happy you're home. So I gave the kid love on the way out the door and love when they came in the door. And that's what our children need. Love. In the story of Jonah, you see the men throwing boxes off the ship. And we could read that part again if you wanted to in verse 5. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Verse 5. And when I see that, I am reminded that in our sin, when we are committing acts of sin, it deprives us of the good stuff in our life. We're all on a journey. We're all on a boat. We're all sailing. And when there's sin on the ship, the cargo gets thrown off. Now, that cargo, I'm sure it was valuable. I'm sure that it had importance. Otherwise, why would it be on the ship to be transported? And here are the people dealing with a sin, throwing off all the blessings that they have in this life. It's, it's a sad reality of someone who is lost in sin. And maybe you could see it this way. We have a simple reminder to our child that for as long as they are departing from our love, they are losing some of the greatest blessings in their life. And if we say it that way, if we display it that way, it can be very helpful, helpful in, in, in having them change course. Okay? And as mothers, you bring more blessing into a child's life than three fathers combined. I mean, I, I'll just say it the way I feel about it. I think mothers are just embodiments of love. And they just share the good stuff with their kids all the time. In Jonah's case, he was so determined in his sin, so determined that it would be better to die than to obey, that he would tell the sailors to throw him overboard as well as the cargo. And we still see a father ready to catch him there at his lowest, lowest point. And as moms, I think that there's a challenge here for us to be ready for the deepest of lows because they're probably coming. It is not out of the question that at some point your child will hit rock bottom. The question is, do they believe you love them unconditionally? That's what matters. Let, I mean, they're going to make their own choices. Your choice is, I'm going to love that kid as hard as I possibly can. Let me tie all this with a separate scripture passage. I'll use actually uh, one from Jonah. And I uh, now understand why the printer said it was out of paper because I'm missing a whole document here on my notes. But if I remember right, Jonah chapter 4, we'll start here, then we'll go, we'll move on. In Jonah verse 4, verse 1, it said, But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry that the fact that the, the, Nazarites, or, yeah, the Nazarites turned from their sin. And so he prayed this extremely weird prayer to the Lord. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this repentance of this people, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. And the question I have when you read that is, is that also true of me? Is that me? Am I like my God? When my kids look at me as their mother, do they see the fact that my mom is full of grace. She bestows on me good things even when I don't deserve it. Is that, is that who I am as a mom? 
Does she, do, do our kids see us as compassionate? When all, when all hell is breaking loose, does, are they compassionate with the fact that they're going through this crisis and they want to be there to support them in that crisis? Even if it's a crisis of sin, even if it's a sin against herself, is she still showing compassion for what's going on? Are we slow to anger? You know, slow to anger. Your God is slow to anger. I was thinking about the Old Testament, and I uh, can't give you the passage, but I can paraphrase it. Um, God's people had to go in the land of Egypt for 400 years. And they had to go to four, they in the, the Egypt for 400 years because the sin that was in the promised land hadn't come up to full capacity yet. For 400 years, God hoped and God waited for the people that were in the promised land to possibly repent and turn from their sins. And that is how slow to anger your God is. Before he went in there and asked these people to wipe these people from the face of the earth, he waited, your God waited 400 years for this people group to repent before he actually acted out in righteous anger against said children of God. I think it's important for us to have the same kind of understanding here, that we need to be slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. In other words, there are very appropriate times where you could really give it to your kids. Could you? You know, some kind of like kung fu panda way. Maybe you don't. Maybe you show a little compassion in the sense that you can go to Scripture on the battlefield that we should be fighting, and you can say, you know what? I'll be real honest with you. The sin that you're committing, I also committed. And I found here in this section of Scripture that it was a disobedience to the God of the universe. And I had to go and make that right. And he showed me grace and he showed me compassion if I repented of my sins. That's all I need from you. I don't need to give you a consequence. I need you to repent and make it right because this is the battleground and this is what God says is right and what is wrong. You got to fight from here in order to win the day for your kids. You can't fight out of circumstances and out of emotions and out of anger and out of taking things or not taking things or putting things or not putting. Just love and fight the battle that, that is here. Okay, And I'm not trying to say that we can love without discipline or that we can love without telling our kids right and wrong. I'm just saying that I'm just trying to have you reflect as a mom. When my kids see me, how do they feel about me? Do they, do they know I take them to scripture and fight the battle there? Does my mom treat me with grace and loving kindness? Does my mom lash out on me for the smallest little thing, or does she show me compassion and loving kindness? That, that is your calling to be like your God. And I know that there's so many in this room who do it well, and I know that there's others in this room who are really trying to do it their best, and I just continue to pray that God will just pour out his blessings on you as you teach through these trials using Scripture as your foundation for the battle that you're fighting. And I, and I know that he will bless, and I know that he will store, and I know that uh, everything in your life will, will get better. Okay, So I appreciate you letting me spill my heart that way this morning. Let's pray as we close, and we'll stand and sing our last song. Father God, we thank you so much for today. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we just want to be like you in so many ways. Lord, help us to be that kind of lover as you loved us. Help us to love others, even to the smallest of others. Lord, help us to really think through and not be foolish when it comes to handling our children. But let us fight the battlefield of your word and let it help. And we just pray that as we do, it will penetrate their lives. For we know it won't come back void. Lord, again, a special blessing on these ladies, on these mothers, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. Feed your word to them, empower them through scripture, bless their lives with 
with uh, great families uh, who, are, who are on their way to coming to know you as their personal Savior. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.